Hello everyone, and uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, my topic today is about data and personal information, especially something about export essentials. Um, uh, I guess a lot of audience here um, from Europe, uh, from time to time, you have this demand about exporting, extracting data from China or personal information from China. And, and export it back to your home country. So uh, recently, China has um, introduced a lot of new laws about um, uh, this kind of export activities, and um, it raises a lot of uh, uh, curiosity, anxiety, a lot of things, you know, among uh, uh, EU entities. Um, so I guess uh, what I hope for today is to uh, give a little bit of introduction and give a little bit of uh, comfort to uh, some of the EU entities that um, it's not as bad as you think, but there's still something that you, you need to comply with and you need to do. All right, here we go. Something about myself first. Uh, give me a little bit, you know, a few minutes to introduce myself. My name's Albert. I'm from Hong Kong, uh, but I've been in um, Beijing for uh, the past um, 18 years already. I got my qualification in Hong Kong and also in mainland China. Our law firm, Andy Abroad, um, is a um, China law firm, but uh, we also have a branch in Hong Kong as well. By saying a branch, we are not talking about a representative office. It's a real branch, meaning that we can advise on Hong Kong law as well. And on top of that, I got um, CIPP. Um, uh, it's some of you guys, if you are you know, in this industry, you might know that um, it is the qualification for um, uh, for uh, information privacy. Um, so I, I guess I can speak the same language as uh, a European information um, that's happening professional. Uh, over the past um, eight, 10 years, I've been in house with um, some tech companies, uh, Google, Motorola, Lenovo. Um, so my, my basic practice over the past 20 years has been um, IP. But data is so related to IP and it's such a big topic that uh, uh, nowadays on top of my, you know, uh, regular IP practice, I extend my practice a little bit to data and TMT as well. Um, that's enough for my self-promotion. Let's, uh, let's start. So uh, uh, in the next um, 20 minutes, I guess, uh, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to introduce briefly uh, we don't have enough time. Something about um, the new laws about data in China. And since you guys in Europe, uh, you might be familiar with GDPR. I want to do some comparison between PIPR, Personal Information Protection Law, and GDPR. Um, and I will also talk about um, data export, PI export. And uh, at the end of it, um, uh, I'm going to give some uh, practical tips. Uh, by saying practical, um, uh, before the start of this presentation, Austin has kept on saying that my major audience is SME, so they won't have a lot of resources on compliance. So I'm going to uh, uh, introduce some minimal things that uh, you, you might want to do uh, in order to comply, you know, uh, the Chinese um, uh, export requirements. And before I start, I want to share a story first. What is this about? It was uh, uh, two, three years ago, I was uh, being introduced by a um, European uh, company, uh, which is very good at um, AR. Um, they want to introduce their AR technology to China. Um, and I'm the lawyer, you know, drafting the license agreement, constructing the uh, the, 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 the cooperation framework with a Chinese partner that they want to find. And then I said, well, how much is a royalty? Uh, how much are you going to earn from, from China? And they said, no, I'm not going to prepare to earn any money in China. What do you want, right? If you're not earning money. No, I want data in China. I, uh, because there are a lot of users, scenarios that you won't be able to find in Europe, but with China, a single market with the biggest population in the world, not because anymore, India is the biggest. Um, that there are a lot of things that you won't be able to do in 
in, in Europe, but you can do it in China. So, so, so I said, let what you want, right? And 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 they said they they they, they elaborated a little bit and say that well, they want to find a, a reliable Chinese partner. So yeah, very good at software, and they want to find a hardware manufacturer in China. China is very good in hardware. Uh, they uh, they 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 are willing to transfer the whole technology to the Chinese partner. And there are two aims that they want to achieve. One is about the data that I said. They want to extract the data, improve the technology so that they can they can sell to the rest of the world. And second is they want to draw a red line between China and the rest of the world. China belongs to the hardware manufacturer. OK, you earn the money, you have the technology, it's all yours. But don't go across that red line. Well, the rest of the world belongs to me, and okay, you you belong to China. So, so, so it's it's fascinating that like gone are the days when, 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 when it was like forty years ago, Coca Cola came to China and they had this idea about you know earning one one dollar from each of Chinese and you can get one like one point three billion. This is gone by days. It's like not anymore. Uh, what I want to say in this story is that uh, it's not about the money generating uh, thing that attracts foreign companies to come to China is it's, it's more about the data. And 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 the story wants to tell you is like how important is data, and that's why the government um, introduces the three laws, the three pillars of data laws, uh, in order to regulate it because the government also knows that data is the future. So three laws. Cyber security law, data security law, and um, the final one is PIPL, Personal Information Protection Law. Uh, in these uh, three pieces of law, um, there are a lot of concepts that is being introduced. One is about CII, uh, Critical Information Infrastructure Operators. Um, we will go through the definition of it later. Important data, again, we will go through the the, 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 the definition of it later, and also the sensitive PI. Um, if um, if I'm being asked to um, to, to to summarize the the essence of compliance in China is that you don't want to classify yourself as a CI operator. You don't want to process important data, and you don't want to export sensitive PI. Um, to the rest of the world, if you can limit the scope of this handling of info, important information and sensitive PI, you are basically you know eighty percent compliant with Chinese law already. Next, um, uh, a lot of audience perhaps you have this idea about okay, I don't have any business presence in China. I, I don't have a subsidiary in China. Do I still need to comply with PIPL? Uh, the answer is yes, um, because it has this extraterritorial effects. Being that even if you are not in China, but if you are providing services to individuals in China, if you are analyzing behavior of natural persons in China, you still need to comply with it. The next question a bit would be, how 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 is the enforcers in China? How are they going to 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 enforce it against you if you have a presence in China? Uh, this question is valid, but you would never know one day if you know come to China or not, or if you have business partners that you know are already in China. So um, and 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 the internet is international, isn't it? You you never know uh, uh, who is uh, browsing your website. Uh, inputting information and providing you uh, uh, personal information in China. Uh, that's why there are several things that you need to do, uh, like um, uh, revising your um, privacy policy. Uh, we'll go to that later. Uh, liabilities, um, there is personal liability, there's corporate liabilities. Uh, is it a lot? Um, is this quite a lot? But uh, you have something similar in uh, GDPR as well, so 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 it's not something very surprising. But uh, what I want to add here is that um, 
it's something very new. There's no big penalties against international companies as yet because the law is still very new. So uh, we data professionals, we expect that in the next three to five years, it's still a consolidating period. Uh, the law enforces will focus more on compliance, will focus more on review of uh, export applications and all these. But after a while, they will start to issue penalties against um, uh, non-compliance after five years. So, uh, so we need to expect that in the future. Something about uh, PIPL and GDPR. Um, uh, if we summarize it in a few words, uh, GDPR is very much about protection of individual rights. I think it has some historical backgrounds and, and, and you guys will know better than me. But uh, in China, it's very much about data sovereignty to make sure that the government has the full control of the data flow and also the, the, the protection. Um, is it very scary? Not necessarily because, well, uh, I think somehow uh, data sovereignty is something that all governments in the world, uh, they, they also focus on it. But uh, China is even more so compared to the rest of the world. And something um, that makes it more complicated is that while, you know, a lot of uh, European um, countries, uh, the US or, or Japan or the UK, they, they might be signing um, uh, uh, treaties uh, to recognize each other's data protection law and um, to uh, enhance the data flow within those countries. I guess like in the near future, no, no, no country is going to, not a lot of countries, not no, but not a lot of countries going to sign any treaties with China. I guess it takes time for um, a lot of countries to see the implementation of PIPL and, um, and, 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 and to, in order to decide whether to sign treaties. So, so there's no exemption, there's no treaties. And it means that all the countries coming to China, they need to comply with the same set of rules. Um, there's one exception, GBA. I will go through that later on. GBA means Greater Bay Area, which composes of Hong Kong, Macau, and some cities in uh, Guangdong province. There's an exception. Um, liability, I mentioned it already, and uh, the difference next is the uh, sensitive PI. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, PIPR has a wider scope of uh, definition in sensitive PI comparing to your uh, uh, GDPR. Uh, I highlighted some of the differences between China and Europe. Um, financial accounts, financial data is not considered as sensitive in GDPR, but it's sensitive in China. Um, there are some special categories that is regarded as sensitive in Europe, but not in China, like uh, sex life, sex orientation, trade union membership is sensitive, but not that sensitive in China. Um, what I want to say is just that they are different. And um, if you are talking about dealing with sensitive PI uh, in China, dealing with it, processing it, exporting it, storing it, you have a higher standard uh, that you need to meet. Uh, for example, there's a concept of separate consent, meaning that, okay, well, um, a typical standard consent language, right? You put a tick and then you said, okay, I, I agree with transmitting my data to you for the processing. And separate consent means that on top, there might be an other page or additional language that you need to add to your consent language in order to extract uh, PI from China. Regardless of whether you are located in China, you have a subsidiary in China collecting uh, for you, or you are basically in Europe collecting data in China. Next, data sovereignty. Um, um, you, you, you see this definition of CII, you see this definition of uh, important data. Uh, what I want to stress is that is the definition is wide. Uh, 
anything that affects national security, okay? High, national economy, high standard. But what about people's livelihood or public interest? Um, China is not a common law jurisdiction, meaning that um, the government might have a lot of discretions in defining like whether you are CII, whether you are handling important data. Having said that, you still have things to do. Uh, for example, you can find a an agent in China to issue to 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 do the um uh in in Europe you have this concept of uh, PDIA uh, personal data impact assessment is in it. In China, we have something similar called PIPIA personal information protection impact assessment. There's something similar. You are uh, ask an agent to assess it for you. And at least there's someone confirming with you that you are not CII, you are not dealing with important data. If uh, the government comes to you, at least you can show to the government saying that, you see, it's not only me saying that I'm not handling important data. We have an agent saying that. The agent is recognized by you, endorsed by the um, uh, uh, CAC Cyber Security Administration of China. That is the extra protection that you can get. Uh, general principle is that PI and important data generated in China must be stored in China. It also means that normal data flow from China is still okay without localization for now. Uh, but if you're dealing with important data, if you're dealing with, if you are a CII, you need to obtain CAC approval. Um, for PI export, uh, there's no minimum threshold, meaning that as long as you are having a subsidiary in China collecting just one subject, one piece of PI from China to back to your home country, you still need to do one of the following. So it's divided into degrees. Uh, if uh, I don't I don't specify it here, but uh, in a nutshell, it means uh, if you are exporting uh, more than 100,000 uh, PI or uh, 10,000 pieces of sensitive PI back to your home country, you need to do this security assessment. You need to get the approval of CAC. Yeah, you, you need to uh, document your agreement with the importer. The exporter has to sign a contract with the importer, um, so on and so forth. Um, so it's a long process. That's why I want to say that try not to deal with many uh, uh, PI, then you're safe for now. But when you're say, I'm saying that you're safe for now, you still need to sign the standard contract, something similar to uh, SEC in um, in, in GDPR, which is the standard contract to be signed between uh, your China subsidiary and your headquarters in, um, in Europe. Um, so you can see that even within your um, uh, 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 group of companies, you still need to sign it internally between China and uh, your headquarters in Europe. Is there an exemption? Uh, I mentioned it already. Uh, there are some in the pipeline, but not yet uh, 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 coming to law yet. Um, there's this draft regulation on regulating and promoting cross-border data flow. Uh, there was a consultation period that ends in October. And uh, going to the bottom of the list, you can see the deadline for signing and filing standard contract is like December the 1st, 2023. So uh, after October, a lot of people were expecting that that draft regulations would come to law by December. The answer is no, it's still after consultation is not coming to law yet. Meaning that again, it goes back to what I said, as long as you are exporting one piece of personal information, you still need to sign the standard contract, you still need to do the assessment and all these. Um, in this draft regulations, there are some exemptions. 
um, for example, if there is data flow from free trade zones, they are trying to in China. Just check it out from Wikipedia. <laughs> from uh, from China to Europe, there are some exemptions. There are all some other exemptions, uh, which is that, uh, uh, for example, if you are having uh, subsidiaries in China, uh, you are exporting employees data from China back to your home country, there will be some exemptions, but not yet there. Meaning that uh, if you are uh, still doing this export activities, you are not in compliance, strictly speaking, uh, with the Chinese law already. Um, so uh, we'll wait and see uh, if the drug regulations come to mind. The second is already issued, which is the um, which is the mini treaty. We can't say it's a treaty because well, well, it's it's, it's under un, under under Chinese government. It's, it's between um, Guangdong province the southern province in, in, in China, and Hong Kong and Macau. Um, if, um, if you are talking about collecting data in Guangdong, if you are exporting to Hong Kong or Macau, if you are not exporting to the rest of the world, a lot of you know, criteria in all the text you have, you can benefit from this exemption that you only need to sign a standard contract and document the contract itself with the Guangdong Authority and Hong Kong Authority without doing, no, no, you still need to do this uh, PI, PIL, uh, personal information uh, assessment, but not filing it with the government. You got the exception. So, um, and all the deadlines, the two deadlines, the major two deadlines, which is the data export security assessment deadline, the standard contract deadline is already packed, meaning that um, uh, for those people who are still exporting PI, is there's a red flag. But uh, but uh, be safe. You're not the only one. I've seen a lot of clients still would be. They haven't filed their um, their application yet, so you're not the only one. But but better be quick, right? All right. Uh, the final two pages about um, practical tips. Uh, minimal, I put it minimal. It's like, okay, the, the, the list that you can do in order to meet the um, challenge requirement for now. Um, uh, there's a requirement of regardless of whether you have a president in China, not have a president in China. If you are extracting data from China, you need to have a local representative. It's DAC, Cyberspace Administration of China, they, they want to steal someone that they can get hold of if there's anything wrong, right? If you are in Europe, they can cannot, you know, uh, enforce against you. But if you are an Asian representative in China, they can talk to them. Um, uh, I think you need to do it now. Uh, uh, that's the minimal you can do uh, because uh, you, you probably have your own privacy policy already you might have an append, uh, appendix for uh, for the US, you have another appendix for UK, but if you haven't got one for China, you better have one. And um, as I said, there's a special consent language in China, which is different from the rest of the world. What that mandate minimal you need to do. Um, if you want to do more, um, sign a standard contract with one of the overseas uh, recipient. When I said one of the overseas recipients, it's very often, think about real life scenario, uh, is that the export is not exporting to a particular country. It's always exporting to a cloud and all the countries, all your subsidiaries in the rest of the world, they have the access to that cloud, isn't it? That's the practical practice. Um, the law is not very clear about who is going to be the importer, the recipient in this kind of scenario? No, but at least you want to sign with one of them. Probably the one that owns the cloud, but um, the law is not very clear about it yet. PIPIA, you want to do it. Filing with CAC is on the assumption that you have an office in China. If you don't have an office in China, you don't need to do it for now. Um, 
you need to review uh, your current global network service provider, be it um, uh, AWS, usually, right? Or um, what else do you have? Uh, Microsoft. Um, probably they have their own MLPS, multi level protection scheme. Um, uh, they are being wrecked uh, under China law. A certain kind of level of protection, a certain kind of level of uh, data that they're handling. It's a ranking. Uh, if you are handling more important data, you have to have more, you know, protection uh, level. So make sure that the uh, service provider that you you are using have already undergone this kind of protection assessment already, um, and also review your template employment contracts, the band contracts to make sure that the proper um, data protection clauses is already there. Um, also limited. That's why I said right. Limited, limit the number of sensitive PI that you're handling. Uh, limit uh, the the number of important data that you're handling. Try to avoid or yourself or from being uh, classified as CII. Um, or before exporting your PI, why don't you keep the data in China? Well, one of the reasons why you collect all this PI is to improve your technology, isn't it? You want to get data. Big data is all about big data, isn't it? Everyone talks about big data. Uh, you want to collect your data back to your home country and improve your technology. Why don't you do it in China? Well, ask your engineers, set up your office in China. Uh, ask some engineers to 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 analyze the uh, personal information locally improved technology and exported technology back to your home country that will be less sensitive also you can encrypt your pi you know make it you know unidentifiable personally there are a lot of ways technical legal a lot of ways that you can do it um final page is something about working with uh chinese partners i, I share with you the stories about you know how to find a uh, partner in china uh, maybe sometimes you want to find a uh, Chinese partner who is very strong in hardware technology. They might not be very good in software, but very hard in hardware. You want to work with them. You you, you even can give them technology for free. Uh, but um, uh, you probably want to find a Chinese partner who has a strong background, maybe a lot of connection with the government, so that if your technology is being infringed in China, that company is in the same boat with you. They want to protect their rights as well, and they will do the enforcement in China, especially if we are talking about products, hardware. 90% of the products, global counterfeits, they, they come from China, come on. So if you can stop the export of counterfeits from China, infringing products from China, it means that you can resolve that 90% of your problem in the world. So find a reliable Chinese partner, be it a state-owned enterprise or BAT. BAT means, um, the old BAT means buy do Alibaba 10 cent. The new BAT means buy dance Alibaba 10 cent, uh, Alibaba 10 cent, and M means Meituan, right? All these, you know, big companies, that big names. Um, they, they have the local networks that they, they will be uh, responsible for all the data protection issues in China. So you can focus more on something more important, isn't it? But Having said that, you probably still want to do the first bullet point, which is define the data ownership, the PI ownership, uh, depending on your business um, uh, development. There are things that you will do. You want to export and, and bring it back to your home country, right? So you probably want to define the contract as well. Uh, finally, something about NTA, um, uh, a non disclosure agreement, um, which is very common in the rest of the world, but uh, I want to give a warning that is, is not very reliable. So still, uh, if there's any trade secret, company secret, uh, if you want to disclose it to your Chinese partners, there are additional technical and non-technical things that you need to do. Um, finally, well, I, I, I prepared something about, you know, industry specific, like 
there are many industries and 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 all the things that you might want to know, but uh, I don't know the audience of uh, of today, so um, I just want to highlight one point, which is about app development. Um, probably um, uh, in, in Europe there are a lot of good apps you want to introduce into China, uh, uh, but um, uh, if you want to put it in a platform for people to download, be it Apple platform or you know Android platform, you still need to get the license from China. And there's a set of rules that you need to comply with, uh, especially um, every every month, CSD would uh, issue a list of apps not complying with the laws. Uh, the major issue is that a lot of them, they collect more uh, data than what is necessary for them to conduct business. So, so the necessity concept, you know, the minimal concept, you know, all, all these concepts you have in GDPR, you have in PIPO as well. So it's not hard to understand, but still um, it's something that you need to take care of if you come to China. That's my presentation and I welcome any questions. Now the later to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So the questions, uh, question and answer time will be after Lisa's presentation. If you have any questions already uh, for Albert, you can start sending them through uh, the chat uh, if you are joining online or uh, you are welcome to raise them during the Q&A session. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Alba, for the excellent presentation. My name is is Lisa Lu. I'm the IP business advisor from China IP SME Hub Desk, uh, where we provide the first line and confidential and free of charge advice to the European companies uh, when they internationalize in China. And our service is focused on intellectual property. Just a few words about me. Um, I, I hold a double master's degrees in law from China University of Political Science and Law, also the University of Hamburg. Before joining the China IPSM help desk, um, I worked as trademark lawyer for parental intellectual property and chance and partner. Um, before we start today's topic, I would like to in, um, I would like to invite everyone to um, have a quiz with me. There are only three short questions, and we will have the same quiz afterwards, after the after the training, to make sure everyone's get the most important messages after today's webinar. And um, please take your phone and scan this QR code or implementy.com and put the voting code. Um, the whole quiz is anonymous. So we will not see your name or see your answer. And if you already finished the first question, please wait, we will move to the next question. Sorry, we have uh, one uh, a colleague online who says that he cannot see the screen. Are we? Oh. Uh, And let's take them some line to see the Just one second, and we will share the question, the quiz with everyone. Okay, the first question. Um, if a com Chinese company has registered a European company's trademark in China, 
and this European company want to legally purchase a purchase. That means this assignment has to be filed with the Chinese trademark office, which is CNIPA. Um, which statement is true under this circumstance? Um, so if the company has a registered EU trademark, the CNIPA will always allow the assignment of the trademark from the Chinese company to, to uh, the European company. And if the Chinese company owns many trademarks and has already been assigning those to different companies, then the CNIPA may refuse the assignment trademark transfer. Um, or according to the new regulation, trademark can no longer be purchased in China, which is correct. And if you do not scan any QR code, we encourage you to scan now and participate into this quiz. Let's move to the next question. It's a very short question. According to the current patent law, how long is the protection term of design pattern in China? 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years? Okay, last question. What can happen if there is no agreement between the company and the employee inventor? That means the employee who contributes to the patent invention um, regarding the invention reward. The first one is the company must pay a standard reward of 10,000 RMB for an invention patent to the employee inventor. Second, second, um, second option is if the patent is licensed, the company does not have to pay the inventor employee. And the last option, the company should pay the employee a certain percentage of the profits made from the patented invention. Which statement is right? In the situation of no agreement, Okay, thank you for the voting. And um, I'm not going to reveal the answer now. You will have to learn it after the whole training. We will have to send quiz afterwards, so you will know the results very soon. I hope um, everyone can see the screen again. So today we will discuss the very important and interesting updates on the new tra trademark and patent regulation in China. Uh, firstly, we will uh, read about the 2023 IP statistics in China, and then we will move to the draft of amendments to the trademark law, also the guidelines regarding the trademark assignment procedure. Um, Following that, we will see the updates on the pattern law and rules. And lastly, I will leave some takeaway messages to everyone. So uh, if you read about the grant numbers um, in 2023, compare that with 2022, then you will find that the grant number are lower. Um, year on year. And this grant number are the number that the CNIPA grant to the rights, including the invention pattern, utility model, and design pattern and trademarks. They are not the uh, application number. So we see that um, we see that um, all the, most of the number are lower than the year before. And why is that? There are different reasons. Um, to reduce first is to the CNIPA is trying to reduce the malicious trademark and abnormal pattern filings. So the CNIPA these days exempt in a stricter manner that leads to the utility model, design pattern, and trademarks decline. Um, the, this decline indicates the shift of quantity to um, quality in trademarks and pattern. 
Um, in July 2023, the CNIPA released the 2023 outline for building a powerful IP country and implementation promotion um, plan for 14 5 year plan. And from this outline, we can see the plan of uh, the legislative plan of CNIPA in 2023. And for those laws, it's it's not about to complete them. It's more about they are the focus of the work of CNIPA. So, for example, uh, the first one is the new round of amendment to trademark law. The amendment it's not final yet, but it's um it's on the stage of draft. Um, for the amendment to the implementing regulation of patent law and the amendment to the guidelines of patent examination, they are actually into force very early this year. And except for the pattern and trademark, which we are going to introduce the details today, there are also the, the, the other part um, of the IP law, including the copyright and e-commerce law and anti-unfair competition law. Um, this is the draft of amendments to the trademark law, which was released in January 2023. Remember, this is just a draft. It's not into force. Therefore, the practice, it's not changed yet. But from the draft, we can see the trend of the CNIPA. First is to combat bad face registration, trademark scorter, trademark holder. And second is to emphasize it's important to use your trademark after the registration. So let's see some changes. Um, I will go through it briefly. First is um, the same IPA set of five for bad face trademark registration up to 50,000 uh, 50, RMB. And also for the bad face trademark registration, if the rights holder sued it in the court, there could be a civil compensation to cover the expense paid for the whole legal proceeding. And to emphasize the importance to use the trademark, CNIPA also forbids repeated trademark application. That means one applicant, one identical mark. Because this is a, uh, this is a strategy for a lot of companies to repeat filing trademarks as defensive measures. Um, these new rules has good um, has the good um, impact on combating bad face registration. However, it does have impact on the strategy of a lot of company who did need to use this strategy to defend themselves. And so we are looking forward to see what will be the updates in the actual, the final version of the trademark amendments. Um, uh, the new rule, uh, the, the, the draft also introduced some trademark infringement related to e-commerce activities. So in e-commerce platform, if one use similar or identical trademarks, it could be concluded as trademark infringement. And to emphasize the importance of trademark use, the trademark registration should provide evidence of use of trademarks to CNIPA every five years. However, the draft did not give the details of what type of evidence could be included as valid and proper use evidence. Um, but if it became true, it would become a huge burden for the rights holder because first, the evidence collection, second, every five years to um, submitting such evidence, it could cause an um, extra lawyer autonomy, autonomy fees and also extra uh, compliance actions. And also the draft shortened the opposition period from three months to four to two months. However, again, this is just a draft. Um, the, in practice, there is no change yet. But what actually changed is the rules regarding the trademark assignment procedure. So in September 2023, the CNIPA um, published the guidelines regarding the trademark assignment. In, if you read the guidelines, um, the CNIP actually lists six situations that the trademark assignment could be refused by the CNIPA. That means even as a right holder, you pay the trademark seller the money, um, you sign the agreement, but eventually you still do not get any trademark rights. 
for example, if the trademark is a, a collective trademark or certification mark, which is highly relevant to uh, geography indications. And if such mark is transferred to an unqualified holder, then the assignment will be refused. Um, the second situation is the trademark bearing GI origin or enterprise name to, um, and then this trademark assigned to a, a trademarks buyer who is who is um, definitely um, associated with with this trademark. And the third situation is the trademark belongs to a series trademarks and under the same ownership. Instead of transferring the whole series trademarks. Um, the, the assignment only applies to a few trademarks, then the assignments could be refused as well. Similarly, if the assignment will lead to negative or adverse impact, which is really vague, and uh, such assignment will be refused as well. And the last situation will be my focus today. So let's read the article and then I will illustrate in a case study. So if a trademark of a assignment, which is the trademark seller and this this um, seller owns a, a large number of trademarks and has previously assigned different trademarks to different unrelated buyers and the trademark sellers if the trademark seller fails to provide the evidence of use then these assignments this trademark transfer may be refused and let's read um, we will go through a case study to to explain further um, with the new guidelines, there will there also be some new rules. For example, like the assignees should conduct a tra trademark background check before um, before buying the trademark. And after the purchase purchase of trademark, the assignment cannot be an excuse against any invalidation or non-use cancellation on the grounds of bad faith. So therefore. Um, purchase, purchase the malicious trademark could be risky to lose the trademark rights because in the past the trademark assignment could be a very quick solution to get the trademark back for the rights holder and nowadays it might not be the ideal solution therefore background search is important and register try, try trademark in China as soon as possible before the malicious trademarks came out and to overcome the malicious trademark, consider the other actions, opposition, non-use cancellation, and validation. Uh, for all the details of this action, and if anyone needs further clarification, can come to me. So let's read about this case study. Um, so we received an inquiry from an EU SME who tried to use a trademark assignment to recover its right from trademark scorter who owed over 90 trademarks more than half of them are copied from uh, foreign brands. The EU SME filed a request for assignment after signing um, a, an agreement with the trademark scorter. And this request was filed, the, the trademark transfer request was filed with the CNIPA. After the submission, the CNIPA request the evidence of use from both assigner and the assignee. And the SME, as the assignee, they provide the proof of use in a Chinese online shop, and the seller, the trademark scorter, has no evidence of use, and eventually the CNIPA refused to assignment based on in insufficient proof of use and the bad faith of the assigner. So from this case study, we can see that, again, trademark assignment may not be an ideal action to overcome, to clear, to get your right back in China anymore. Um, before trademark assignment, the SME should run a background search to see if the seller has bad faith. And to clear the malicious trademark, consider other options like opposition, use cancellation, navigation. And for the right holder, it's important to well preserve the evidence of use, not only for the to prove it to the CNIPA, and also if the draft of amendment to trademark law actually came into force. It's also possible you ha will have to provide the use evidence every five years. And lastly, is registering trademark in China as soon as possible. Um, we already see the updates on trademark law, and let's see the updates on patent law and rules. Actually, the patent laws um, has been changed a lot 
ever since 2020. So in 2021, we have the amended patent law, and this year we have two imp important patent regulations and rule. First is the implementing regulations of patent law. The second is the patent examination guidelines. The latter two, they are actually explain further of the practical um, situation regarding the patent law. And there are many new systems and new, um, there are many new systems was int introduced in the patent laws and regulations. We will see some of them. So first is the principle of good faith. It's very similar to the trademark law. Um, so the principle of good faith shall be followed when filing a trademark application and exercising patent rights. Um, if vi violating the good faith um, could be faced a fine up to RMB 100,000. And um, actually the good faith principle also applies to open license system. The open license system is um, it's a new system also introduced by the patent law. That means um, for the trade, for the patent rights holder, it can voluntarily, voluntarily license to everyone, every individual, every entity to use their license uh, to, to use their patent. And as a return, the patent annual fees will be reduced or waived. So this is the good um, good faith principle. And what opportunities and what good news it brought to the SME? First abnormal patent application will be reduced. That means less infringement, hopefully. Um, what is the best side for the SMEs? What if the SMEs, EU SMEs patent is, re, um, is regarded by the CNIPA as against good faith? How to prove the good faith for the EU SME and what evidence could be used? That will remain unquestionable. And the second update, it's, it's a it's a great good news for the SMEs. It's the design patents updates. So first, international industrial design is available in China. Actually, uh, has been in, available ever since 2022. And what is the advantage of international design? First, it allowed the applicant to file only one international application in one language. And it's possible to register in more than eighty, uh, more than ninety countries around the world, and it allowed the patent rights holder to pay one set of fees in single currency. That could save a lot of trouble. And also, it's possible for the right holder to renew and manage the registration directly through WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the organization that runs and manages the international design. And to be um, to be in light with the international design, the CNIPA also extend the industrial design from 10 years to 15 years. And the partial designs also become available. What well, is partial design and why is it important? So for example, if uh, one company decide an app and with this graphic, with this um, graphic user interface, in different devices. In past, in the past, you have to, for the pet rights holder, it will be required to file many applications applied, applying to different devices to protect the GUI. But now with the partial designs, it's possible to just file one application, including all the devices. However, it only protect the partial design, only protect the GUI instead of the devices themselves. But if one company just want to protect the GUI, then it's possible and easier to do that. And the new patent rule also introduced the deferment of examination. What is that? Um, that means um, for the rights holder, it's possible to delay the examination of patent. And it used to, only, used to be uh, applicable only to invention pattern and industrial design. But now for utility models, it's also possible. That means the uh, delay of examination applies to all of the pattern. Um, the delay of examination brings flexibility for developments of clients and provides more times for the rights holder to prepare for and to develop the clients. 
and make the IP um, pattern application more um, stronger. Um, but what is the problem with the delayed of examination? It's the timing. The timing is very limited. Um, you can only file the request when the pattern application is filed or substantive examination for invention pattern. And the new pattern rules also bring a lot of flexibility for priority rights. First, for domestic priority, which only applies to invention pattern and utility model before, and it applies to invention uh, industrial design nowadays. And if the rights holder meets the expiry date of a national invention pattern or utility model, within two months, it's possible to um, file the application to restore your priority rights with the CNIPA. And lastly, if there's anything um, you want to change in your priority claim, uh, in your pattern claim, it's possible to correct and rev revise. However, such correction or revision has to be filed within 60 months from the priority date or four months from the filing dates. Um, also, a very important update is about inventor remuneration. Um, that means the rewards the company given to the employee uh, inventor. So first, inventor remun remuneration can include equity, options, dividends. And without an agreement, that's important, the minimum inventor rewards is raised to 4,000 RMB for an invention pattern and 1,500 RMB for design and utility model. It was raised uh, compared with the previous regulation. And this inventor reward has to be given to the inventor within three months from granted of the pattern. And this is just a reward after the grant of pattern. It's not, it's, diff it's not the same as the, is, as the rewards um, when the pattern is getting profits. So another reward is again without an agreement. Uh, the other reward is um, is to be given based on the net income um, of the license or assignment and also the business profits. So it's important to have an agreement with your employees to make sure these terms is clear. Otherwise. Um, otherwise, the reward paid to the employees could be considerable for the company based on the promoting transformation of scientific and technological achievement law. It could be considerable. We can see that it could be 50% of net income from assignment or license of patent as rewards. That's really high, 50%. And it could be 5% of business profits for three to five years as rewards. Therefore, proactively negotiating with the employee inventor and concludes an agreement. Um, another important update is the patent term adjustment. And PTA only applies to invention pattern, doesn't apply to utility model or industrial design. And this has to be requested within three months from the grant. So how it is calculated? So first, you calculate the whole number of dates from the expiry day of three years from the date of requesting substantive examination for invention pattern to the date of publication of the grant of patent rights, minus the number of days of reasonable delay, and again, minus the number of days of unreasonable delay. The reasonable delay, including the delay caused by the re-examination due to the rejection of an application, also include the ownership disputes like preservation measure during the litigation. And unreasonable delay usually are caused by the right holder, such as failing to respond to a notice within the, pre within the time limits or the uh, delay of examination has been requested. And similar with the PTA, um, a, a very special term, pattern term protection term, protection extension applies to pharmaceutical pattern is PTA. 
Um, for open license system, I already introduced, it could lead to the result of patent annual fees reduction or wave. Um, the CNIP also accept the electronic communication and rec records provided by the right holder or um, patent agency. Um, the new rule eliminate, um, cancel the 15 days mailing delayed when calculating the deadline. Um, there's an important update about the patent evaluation reports, which is very important for the utility model and industrial design because both patent does not go through the substantive examination. So this um, evaluation reports are important to prove the rights are stable and to prove um, to prove the rights of the patent holder. So the new rules actually makes these patent evaluation reports to be um, published. That means there's no need to repeat filing the application to get the reports again and again. And an important change for utility model is to, it's the cancellation, uh, it's the introduction of preliminary inventiveness examination. That also leads to the decline of the grant number of utility models this year. So when a company is think about the strategy of applying patents in China, considering this factor. And the pharmaceutical patent linkage system also be introduced, and the new law, the new law increased the statutory damages in the patent infringement situation, as well as, as, well as the penalty damages. And lastly, I leave some takeaway messages. First, study the IP law and regulation that apply to your industry. Conduct back, background search to make sure not buying the malicious trademark. And while we preserve the evidence of use um, in China. Remember, nowadays, international design is available in China, so you can um, establish your industrial design strategy, including China and other international markets. Proactively negotiate with the employee inventors and include the inventor rewards in the employee agreement. Consult the IP lawyers and experts in China. And for any questions, you can always write to us. And you can follow us in different channel. And again, as I said, we are going to have the same quiz with the same three questions. And I hope this time you will get the answer right. So again, take your phone and scan these QR codes or input menti.com in your browser and put a voting code. This is an anonymous quiz, so no personal information will be collected. Just one second, and we are going to share the share the questions in the screen. And if you did not participate, please um, you can use you can input menti.com and use the code to participate. So the first question I saw um, for people already participate. Uh, let's wait for more people to join us. Okay, let's move to the next question. Yes, okay. Sorry, let's go back to the first question. Um, so this question is about trademark assignment. And because I saw everyone got the right answer, so I think um, we can skip that. But let me just leave some comments. Um, so yeah, based on the new regulation, um, it's possible that the trademark, trademark um, assignment from malicious trademark right holder to the to the actual right holder, it's not, it could be challenged by the CNIPA. And the first question is, 
Uh, the first option is about register EU trademark. That it's not relevant to anything happened in China. So the first first option is wrong. And the third one is according to the new regulation, trademarks cannot longer be purchased in China, which is wrong. Just in some um, situation, the purchase is not available. So let's move to the second one. According to the current pattern law, how long is the protection term of design pattern in China? Is it 10, 15, or 20 years? The right answer is 15 years. Um, this is nothing much to say about that. On the new law, pattern, the new patent law already extends industrial design protection term from 10 years to 15 years. So if in the past two years, 10 years will be right answer, but nowadays the right answer is 15 years. And the last question is a bit tricky. So what can happen if there is no agreement between the company and the employee inventor regarding the invention reward? The first option is the company must pay a standard reward of 10,000 RMB for an invention pattern to the employee inventor. Second one is if the patent is licensed, the company does not have to pay the inventor employee. And um, all of the people choose the last option, which is the right answer. The company should pay the employee a certain percentage of the profits made from the patented invention. Therefore, it's important to conclude, uh, um, conclude what percentage you are willing to pay for the inventor employee. Otherwise, it could be a considerable amount of money the company need to pay for the employee inventor. <laughs> and thank you everyone for joining the quiz. And lastly, I would like to just show you um, just want to show you again our IP help desk um, helpline, and also for any comments about today's events, or including what contents you are interested in more, or what contents you would love to know in the last training, please write to us from this feedback form. Yes, uh, IP topics, um, including industry-specific guides or basic IP guides, such as trademarks, uh, patents, trade secrets, and, and so on. And uh, in general, our website functions as a one-stop shop for all uh, IP-related uh, materials, uh, IP-related questions. So I welcome you to also take a look at our, our website and uh, Gone. So here you can see just an example of our guides, and if uh, you can go to the next slide, then just as a reminder, the China IPSME Help Desk uh, is part of a larger help desk family. There are also help desks focusing on the regions of India, Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe itself, and Latin America. All of those help desks provide similar services to what I just described. It's just that the region or a geographic focus uh, of those help desks is different. I have welcomed you to, to check out our website. And finally, here you can also see the uh, access to, to our, our website. And uh, with that, uh, I will finish my my intervention, uh, thank you.